It's a very esoteric subject. It is so esoteric that the book about it wouldn't sell until Jung interpreted it in his own language and uh, the interpretation of uh, Carl Jung is, uh, I think, worse than the original text. Uh, and so uh, very few people have applied themselves to this work with any serious endeavor because it's practically mumbo jumbo unless you have had a sound uh, Chinese background. The esot most esoteric part of the subject will be dealt with in the afternoon uh, session. What I need to do with you now is to give you a substratum on which we can build the esoteric interpretation at the end of the day. The secret of the golden flower. Some of you, of course, I can look round and say comfortably that some of you lived through the last world war. And you will remember how tired the people were in the 1940s. 1940 especially was a dreadful year for Britain and for Europe in general. There were huge blackened areas of London <coughs> where whole blocks of buildings had disappeared and what was left behind was soot and jumbled concrete. And so it was a great joy to the people of London to be confronted suddenly with hosts of gorgeous flowers, daisies, growing on the blackened debris of the Blitz, and it cheered everybody up. And the secret of the golden flower has a lot to do with the subject of joy. Not joy in the sense of it just being happiness, but the real joy that comes from within when we sense something rather beautiful and spiritual. And so I want you to bear these things in mind as we go into our subject, that joy and valour, and that's what the blitzed areas of London suggested, that the people had come out of it, had come out of the terrible stress of the blitz, had come out of it with valour. They had stood up to it and helped by Churchill, they had answered back, accepted the challenge of the Blitz. And then there was these flowers suddenly sprouting everywhere that gave the joy and the valor. And if you are a person given to manifesting these two qualities in your psychosynthesized nature, that merely means your personality or ego um, synthesized with your psyche or soul, if you manifest valor and joy in your life, you are not far from the secret of the golden flower. About the same time, in fact, towards the end of the year, 1940, uh, towards the end of the year, when a winter was biting very hard and the people of Britain were miserable, another event occurred. It was when some British naval cruisers had taken on the powerful battleship, actually pocket battleship, which was called the Graf Spey in the South Atlantic. And these cruisers out shot out, gunned by this battleship, were able to wound it so severely that it was driven into a nearby foreign port. And there it was given 48 hours either to, 
to surrender itself or come out and meet the British cruisers. Well, it came out and the captain, the German captain, sank, scuttled the Hrafs Bay. And of course, the cruisers were delighted and Churchill got the message and at the Guild Hall, he announced to the public that the Hrafs Bay and we were all affected by it. This awful ship was in the mid-Atlantic, sinking uh, ordinary merchantmen and also uh, vessels carrying hundreds of passengers. And it was a great thing to have it out of the way. And this was another example of valor uh, and joy, which is very close, they're both very close to my subject here today. We have a lot to thank nature for. I was joyously impressed with the oddest bunch of daisies here, or are they miniature dahlias? Lovely. Someone has said, God gave us roses in summer, so that we might have memories in December. I have enjoyed rose gardens in my summer, and now that I'm in December in my life, I can remember such lovely things. And we're all built the same way. I haven't had an immaculate conception. I am built like you, and I can appreciate the beautiful things in life and remember them in December. And for me, flowers have always had a very special appeal. I can remember my mother singing to herself, Roses are shining in Picardy. And of course, the Roses of Picardy, it was a music hall song, but it brings back to mind some of the gentle reminders that flowers have given us through the years. And I'm talking about years that are going back 50,000 years, 50,000 years to the ancient Europeans. And there is evidence today that mankind then, 50,000 years ago, strewed their dead with flowers. They did not regard death as being an impenetrable barrier to human consciousness. They thought that death was another stage of growing. And so they strewed flowers on the corpse of the dead person, usually an aged person, but too often young people as well so that after death they might be encompassed with the same joy that flowers had given those uh, who buried them. W. B. Yeats, another favorite poet of mine, wrote about joy in that gorgeous little uh, one-act play called The Land of Heart's Desire. And he said, joy is wisdom. Joy is wisdom, and time is an endless song, which suggests again that there is no death, that time is something that can be a song to people, and part of the Tibet Tibetan book, and indeed the Egyptian book of the dead, is to sing the dying person, to sing songs that the dying person can appreciate, remember, and as he dies or as she dies, the song carries on as they pass over the transitional stage of dying. Today we still offer wreaths and flowers at burials, and we do it out of respect for the dead. And so it, when people say to me, well, what do I do in my meditation? And if I can't meditate, what must I do? Well, Bailey used to say, if you can't meditate, for heaven's sake, learn to sit in silence and appreciate silence. Because in silence, she said, the soul disseminates. 
the soul grows if you are able to create and live in silence. And I chose a place to live, and I've lived there 35 years, so it wasn't just a, a, a temporary impulse. I live in a place where I can get silent. Maybe you say, well, I live in the middle of Nottingham, what can I do here? Well, perhaps you can't, but you better find a place where you can sit in silence so that the soul can disseminate. And we all remember the dead once every year, at least, on November the 11th, celebrating the transition of the gorgeous young men who fought in Flanders. And we go, or we, our attention is focused on the cenotaph, and the queen lays a wreath of poppies, of course, the poppies symbolizing Flanders again, and the dead, each one for a dead soldier, we think. What a lovely observation that was of H.V. Morton's in his book, The Heart of London. You must get this book out of the library. You'll love it. The Heart of London. And in it, he referred to the cenotaph as that solid block of human emotion. And it's still there, and no doubt it will be there through many, many wars or fracas, national fracas in the future. I'm emphasizing the importance of flowers in our lives. And if ever you want to raise your vibrations before a meditation, or when you are feeling down, think of flowers. Think of the beautiful things in the world. Flowers, the roses in summer that give us memories in December. And the golden flower is a symbol of this ability to lift ourselves to an attitude of joy as well as of valor. The joy of living, the joie de vivre, as the French would say, and the wisdom that we find as we grow in spiritual consciousness. You can't get wisdom off uh, the internet. We all know from theosophy that wisdom is, there is a source of it, and that we have to open doors in ourselves in order to let loose the floodgate of wisdom that lies in those realms that we call Atma, Buddhi, and Manas. And of course, in the world of the esoteric, we garland the guru. We garland the guru, and we do this when we meet him. Maybe he's coming off a plane. We garland him with flowers, a tribute to his functioning centers, which are flower-like, as Lidby to describe them. And the flowering centers are the chakras, which are opened in the Guru. And so we garland him with flowers in order to pay tribute to this factor. Before the war, World War II, before the war, I worked for John Dickinson and Company, the paper people, the, the great stationery factories at Apsley and, and in other places, Croxley and so on. And they were a lovely company, an English company, and I was in Durban and I worked for them. And the war began and we were shocked. Uh, out in South Africa, when we heard that the whole of the headquarters of John Dickinson and Co. had vanished in the Blitz. There was just no headquarters left. And this was an English company that had branches all over the world. And we were one of them in Durban. And in South Africa, a small population, Dickinson had used the word Croxley, to describe a particular brand of um, stationery, writing paper, that people bought. Croxley paper, and its slogan was the path of a million pens, 
the path of a million pens. And it used to sell reasonably well. But the name Croxley and the path of the million pens was reaffirmed after the war for a very good reason. And it was this, that during the war years, six long years, John Dickinson and co, who had lost her headquarters and had lost hundreds of men in the war, had been able during the war to keep the stationers of South Africa supplied non-stop, persistently. Sometimes they had nothing more to send out than a handful of pencils to the stationers, but the stationers were supplied constantly. And after the war, they remembered these acts of goodwill and service that Dickinson rendered, and Croxley writing pads became very popular and were sold by all the stationers, and they had to drop the slogan, the path of a million pens, because there were more, much more than a million pads, pens, sold uh, in terms of the Croxley. And I think that is a lovely tribute to this capacity of some people to persist in the harshest times, to persist with their spiritual endeavors. I see what you mean about Nottingham and silence. Today we are entering extraordinary new stages of development of consciousness. One of the fields of consciousness that is attracting young people today as they go to university and high schools and so on is psychology. Psychology. Alice Bailey wrote a whole series on the subject of psychology and she used an instrument, a septenary instrument, called the seven rays to interpret human psychology. And it went very well indeed. And today we are looking at a type of psychology which we call transcendental. Transcendental psychology, what on earth does it mean? It means this, that in the spiritual psychology of the esoteric, we take into account a permanent factor in our existence. We take into account that there is something that survives death and has always survived death and that it is the basis on which Atma, Buddhi, and Manas can build itself into a spiritual person's nature. Transcendental psychology therefore means you may work on something in your life all your life, and you may lose everything in your life, but remain spiritual. And we say that in the esoteric, no matter what happens, we can still bank in a cosmic bank our spir spiritual acquisitions. And it's a very important attitude to bear as we go through life. That no matter how harsh things are, how unkind or how heavy our karma is, our endeavors, our valor, our joy, our spiritual understanding, is constantly banked into and built around permanent atoms. This is, your, this is your philosophy, theosophy's philosophy, that there is something that persists and that it transcends the life that we live, hundreds of these lives on this particular planet and maybe on planets and moons in other systems. But we need something in transcendental psychology to say, yes, it's all very well talking about having a higher self, but how can we come to grips with this concept? We only have five or six senses. What senses do we use to interpret this higher self? What does it look like? What is, it, what is the sound that it makes? What is its odor, its fragrance? And we struggle for this in meditation. 
because in meditation we come to some kind of interpretation of this glorious entity, this transcendental being that exists within us and transcends the many lives that we live. So we need to remember this, that no matter how real everything looks in the world, how certain the hardness and smoothness and the coolness of this table may feel to my touch, it is only an image that we record within us. And if you go into the, the most developed physics of today, and by that we're talking about quantum physics, which is only taking into account today the mental and emotional worlds, as well as the more spiritual realms of Atma, Buddhi and Manas, because quantum physics is dealing with the tiniest particles imaginable. So tiny that when you look at them, they change into waves. This is what's happening in the outer world. And we are saying that don't place too much certitude in the form that you are in contact with. Even the lotus flower, beautiful as it is, even the lotus flower, whether it is on your pond in the garden or whether it has come out of the Nile, the lotus flower is only created through your eyes as an image an image which is fed by electrical impulses. You don't see a lotus. You see with eyes, and the eyes take in the image of the lotus. It's translated into electricity, and the brain accepts it and stores it. And that's what the ancients were trying to tell us the whole time that the world of the physical form is maya. It is maya. It is a grand illusion. And it can encourage people to give their whole lives to it. The maya implies a dancing lady who is trying to attract the attention of the public. And that is what the material world has done especially assisted by the Hollywood impulses. We have learnt to appreciate form to such an extent that people can often not distinguish between what is material form and what is themselves. I have got left some bridges in my, my mouth, some teeth that I don't know whether they're mine or whether they are part of the bridge. But what a state to be in that you can't know in modern circumstances what part of you is you and what part is borrowed. And if you are a lady, God bless them, if you are a lady, this can go on to excess. And the whole field of silicons is one that startles us today because uh, where does it stop, for heaven's sake? Uh, I won't go into that much further. May I just risk uh, a drawing here and point out what we mean when we talk about images. We have, of course, the beautiful lotuses, and we need to know what a lotus looks like because it is so symbolic. It floats on the surface of the Nile or your pond, and its long roots go down into the mud of matter or form, and the lotus itself is beautiful. It usually has some stamens and things in the middle, and we can't help but appreciate it. But then, of course, we have to see the lotus in terms of the brain. And the eyes see it, but the brain interprets the lotus as an image. And the image is created by electrical impulses that come 
from uh, the organs of vision. That's only part of the story, though. If we meditate, we are receptive also to inner observation. We're receptive to what Bailey called the egoic lotus, and the lotus is a symbol, of course, of this eternal entity that you and I have contributed to in previous lives. And so the image in the brain, as it were, in the electrical impulses, is an interplay between these two. And in esoteric psychology, what we're trying to do is to create an understanding of an immortal part of ourselves. An immortal part which has been built over, as I've said before, many, many lives. And myself, I myself, have grown up spiritually on this understanding that there is a higher being and that it is possible, thanks to theosophy and other disciplines, it is possible to make some contact with that higher being and also to contribute to it, to contribute your valor. And valor is part of atma, atma, spiritual will, the ability to survive the blitz, the ability to take a battle cruiser a battleship on with a simple cruiser and to fight, fight for the goodwill of humanity. And so we must consider then flowers, and I've given you examples of them, but the flowering within, the flowering within, we have such brilliant perception we have the ability to look with our eyes and penetrate things with great ease. When we read, we're focusing our attention onto a, a tiny letter that is the size of the head of a pin or the point of a pin. We are able to bring our attention through sight and through hearing and through touch and so on. And so Alice Bailey had devised a method of creating an image within her pupils, her students, encouraging them to see in that image a teleological factor, a meaning that if you could turn inwards and keep the mind clear of its debris and create a space between the eyebrows, you would be able to create a screen that this super being, your higher self, could reflect itself onto. And so she talked about this lotus. And the lotus is a gorgeous chair that I'm sitting in, but it's a bit uh, far from reality, isn't it? Now, let's see. She suggested that the lotus within us has three tiers of petals. Three tiers of petals, and these petals open up progressively during our many lives on the earth. They open up progressively in the sense that time is of the essence and there is a lot of time for them to open. And she suggested there was an outer tier of petals. And these petals took up most of the lives and the three petals here in the outer tier represent uh, the petals of knowledge. She called them the petals of knowledge. And these petals were the result of the senses 
interacting with form on the earth. And it took many hundreds of lives for them to open, and we have to be patient about it, she said. And she said there was a middle layer of petals, and this middle layer represented love petals. And the love petals, according to her, the love petals were um, manifestations of uh, the higher nature of the egoic lotus. And inwardly, and lastly, she said there were sacrifice petals, and I'm using the color of blood in order to emphasize that, and that in acts of sacrifice for humanity in some way, perhaps a mother struggling to get her son through university, in acts of sacrifice, the inner tier of three tiers were opened. And then she talked about a cusp, an inner cusp in the center of the lotus, which the inner cusp was said to be related to initiation. And we, in the esoteric, of course, know about initiation. And she said that these cusps, and they hide, they hide the very core of the structure. These three cusps are opened according to the initiations that we go through. And so this gorgeous uh, structure, which, you know, is something that you have to learn to do. I mean, look at me, I can do this immediately. I can, I can say immediately, there's a five-pointed star. Now that doesn't mean that I've had to sit and construct it, it's there. It's there, it's one of my symbols. And you need to start building some kind of image and recognize that it is only an image to begin with, an image that is a picture acceptable to you as a personality from your higher self. And the higher self will begin to interact with it. And ladies and gentlemen, all I'm talking about is a flower. And if you can appreciate this, you can appreciate the secret of the golden flower. And the secret of the golden flower is related to the soul's lotus. This is a, a, a soul opening up. It's closed, the bud of a lotus, and it's slowly opening. And it favors according to the time of your birth and the place of your birth and other circumstances like karma as to how it will open and which tears will begin to flourish, as it were, under your care. And so we call this the egoic lotus. It's not new. It's not alien to us. I've struggled for 50-something years with this subject, and I don't regret it at all. And after I had been through periods of great sterility, aridness, as if I was living in a desert where nothing would grow, I have also been able to be near the oasis of creativeness. And I have been fortunate in that respect. When I was still a young man, I had been meditating one day, and in the depth of my meditation, when I must have slipped out of my physical body, when I had slipped out of my physical body, I began to be aware of a flapping noise. Pop, 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 pop. And then I was taken further into this state of being, and I was aware that above my head there was a giant lotus a giant lotus, and it was orange in color for me. It was orange in color, and it was gently rotating. And as it rotated, it was as if the various petals that make up the serrations 
were somehow or the other involved in making a sound. And then I became aware that there was a great being sitting in the center of this lotus above me. And I knew that that was my higher self, anybody's higher self, not just mine, available to you if you are capable of, 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 of holding that kind of image. And that's why image making, we call it, of course, other words, image making, visualization, which is the secret of opening ajna, the ability to visualize, the persistence of visualizing, that this visualization was something that we have to, we have to work at. God helps those who help themselves. And if you take easy things to visualize, and then more difficult ones, and eventually lotuses, as well as the faces of masters or adepts, call them what you like, then you become entitled to have an expression from the higher self into you. And so I chose that image for this particular book of mine. Some people call it my flagship, all right? The book is called The Jewel and the Lotus, and it shows a lotus. Mine was much broader than that, and not so ornamental. A lotus above you, higher self, higher self above you, and enthroned in it is the highest being that you can possibly visualize or conceptualize. You know, if it's the Buddha, it could be the Christ. If it's the Buddha, then your mind would go back to the extraordinary words of the Buddha, who says to you, what you are, I was. What I am, you will be. And it's, these are words of encouragement. And if you are prepared to extend your awareness in the way that I've suggested here by visualization, you should earn such an experience for yourselves. Why not? We all love flowers. The beauty of a flower, however, does not stop merely with a gorgeous bloom. According to the book, The Secret of the Golden Flower, Flowers reach down into the core of the earth and they suck, they suck the juices from the, through their roots of course, from the earth and also something from a sacred center which contains the spirit of the earth. And theosophy, we are told, we are taught, that planet, planetary beings, according to the nature of their life, the life on the, on the planet, that planetary beings exist and they have a spirit. It is probably, if it is dependent on material form, a spiritual entity in involution. I never like to hear people talking about evil and things being totally bad. We must remember there are two sides to the coin. An evolution of man's spirit, evolution of man's nature into higher forms is what we call evolution. But there is passing through us, and many of the components of the body, the cellular life of our body, is part of an involution, an involution, not an evolution a stream that is going down into denser and denser forms, passing downwards and passing upwards, and we are the result of these two streams in our own selves. And so the secret of the golden flower is something unique, and it suggests that there is a universal connection with it, that flowers 
and plants, of course. I'm not excluding plants or animals or anything, but living things have a relationship, a connection with forces from the center of the earth. And the subject here today is the development of an understanding and an employment of the golden flower itself. We wear a golden flower sometimes. It's daffodil time, isn't it, at the moment? Daffodils everywhere. We wear a flower sometimes in our lapels in order to pay tribute to the wedding we are attending or whatever. Now, Wordsworth was primarily the poet who loved nature. Most poets do love nature. And we should think carefully about poets and poetry, because we are all poets if we are esoteric. We are all trying to express the beauty of the planet. We're all trying to express the wisdom of the planet and the valor of forms that struggle for life. And Wordsworth wrote a poem called Intimations of Immortality. And he mentions how young children, babies, and then the growing child, are flooded, because they are young, flooded with this planetary spirit, this planetary energy that flows up, to, up into them and you can see it in the love light in the, in the child's eyes, the, the gloire in the child's eyes. And he says, not in entire forgetfulness and not in utter nakedness do we come, but trailing clouds of glory from God, who is our home. Heaven lies about us in our infancy. And he talked about how this, this, this beautiful energy that gives joy and valor, how it affected him, and then how it gradually passes away as he gets older. Not because he's getting old, but because it passes away as we are confronted with materialism. We lose this extraordinary energy, which is termed the golden flower. He wrote, there was a time when meadow, grove, and stream, the earth and every common sight to me, did seem apparelled in celestial light. The glory and freshness of a dream, it is not now, as it hath been of yore, however. Turn wheresoe'er I may, by night or day, the things which I have seen, I can see no more. Our birth is but a sleep and a forgetting. The soul that rises with us, our life star, has had elsewhere its setting and comes from afar. He was wedded to nature. And part of the story of the golden flower is about this wedding that we have with nature. I said you were poets, and poets are part of the most creative beings in our evolution. O'Shaughnessy said this. He said of you and me, we, the poets, we are the music makers, and we are the dreamers of dreams, wandering by lone sea breakers and sitting by desolate streams. We're world losers and world forsakers, on whom the pale moon gleams, yet we are the movers and shakers of the world forever, it seems. With wonderful deathless ditties we build up the world's great cities, and out of a fabulous story we fashion an empire's glory. One man with a dream at pleasure shall go forth and conquer a crown, and three with a new song's measure can trample an empire down. We in ages lying in the buried past of the earth built Nineveh with our sighing, and Babel itself with our mirth, and o'er through them, with prophesying to the old of the new world's worth, for each age is a dream that is dying, or one that is coming to birth. That's you. 
That's us in our struggles, in our vicissitudes, in our ups and in our downs. And for me, it's always been that poetry inspires me. And it is said that when you are inspired by poetry, the words of the poets, Iliad, Odyssey, Homer, must all come back to you. There is a flow of the planetary spirit into you as it meets higher energies that you have created in the upper part of your nature. When we search for the secret of the golden flower, when we search for it, we're on a voyage of spiritual discovery. These are ancient words. They're part of the Gupta Vidya of India. That we must turn inwards for your voyage if you are on a voyage of spiritual discovery. Silesia said, for all your arts, you will not find the philosopher's stone in foreign parts. Don't look for the philosopher's stone outside using your fallacious senses to discover it. Search for it within. You know, Swedenborg was one of the finest scientists of his age, 200, 250 years ago. Extraordinary person. He wrote four massive volumes on the nature of the brain, full of anatomical glories. And he worked hard in science until he was about 45. And then suddenly, science went cold on him. He decided that he was not going to discover the greatest truths in science, but that he needed to turn inwards. And he did. You know, the world is very like that. Christopher Columbus, sailed westward for America, sorry, for the East Indies. He sailed westward because he had secret knowledge that the world was round. It wasn't flat. The world was round, and if he sailed west, therefore he figured that he would end up in the East Indies where the spices were. And sometimes we have to do that when we tread the spiritual path, and especially when we are looking for the secret of the golden self. We have to do things that are contradictory. And Swedenborg's life is a good example of that. But there are others that have done it. Milton, who wrote Paradise Lost, 10,000 lines of the most wonderful epic poetry. A story about heaven and hell. Milton, he was blind. He went blind in old age. He went blind, and in order to write, he would call his daughters to him and hold them to him, and they would come with ink and paper, and he would dictate to them the great glory of Paradise Lost. He had inner vision. The eyes were not essential to him. And Dante Alighieri in his Divine Comedy on Hell and Paradise. Wonderful stuff. These are the beings whose inner creativeness was so important for mankind. And you know, all this is validated today by science. Validated. At long last, science is discovering that it has based its philosophy and its teachings on an illusion. And the illusion was that there's gas, liquid, and solid, and the ionic, and it's all here. When in fact, when in fact, only one-tenth of the material of the universe was being examined by science. Nine-tenths of the universe is still unavailable to scientific investigation. And all that science has based itself on has been only one-tenth of the universe. 
You need to think about these things. People are always saying, what do we do when we are contemplating, when we are preparing ourselves for meditation? What do we think on? Well, the Greeks were quite sure about it. They said, man, know thyself. Turn yourself inwards and know who you are and change yourself. So I always say to people, if you don't know what you are, you can't change what you are. And as you have just heard from quotation, turn inwards if you want to know what you are so that you can change what you are. The Greeks and Romans, of course, looked to nature for inspiration. There was a Pierian spring in Macedonia, and it was said to be the fountain from which the muses were able to drink and to bring their, I call it the secret of the golden flower, to the poets, to the artists, to the architects, to the sculptures. They would come and bring their inspiration there is an admonition about drinking from the waters of the Pierian spring. And it was that you should drink well, drink very deeply. And the saying goes, drink deep or taste not the Pierian spring. A little knowledge is a dangerous thing. And of course, today, circumstances have changed in the last 25 years. In the last 25 years, anybody can go and draw knowledge out of the website, out of your, your um, computers. It's all there. And I've seen people thrill. They thrill with it. They can sit down. I don't need the library anymore. I don't need art. I don't need... It's all here. It's all here on the internet. It's all here on the internet. Knowledge. Well, you know, 2,000 years ago, there was a group of beings, esoteric beings, who were called Gnostics. And they were searching for Gnosis. Two kinds of knowledge, however. There was common sense, which is an attribute of the lower triad or personality. And there was... Gnosis, G-N-O-S-I-S, which was the aspect of reason that we all have to use in the world. Reason that comes to us from the higher nature. And today we must not get carried away by the matter of going to the computer to get our knowledge. My recall of this subject is this, that having the internet and being able to get information to, to order, and I get it sometimes for my lectures, having that is very good, very fine indeed. But for heaven's sake, don't think that it is a substitute for spiritual inspiration. Very few individuals have got the ability to be inspired as they use the computer, to be creative as they use the computer, to be able to originate as they use the computer. I'm computer illiterate, totally computer illiterate. And I'm not upset by it because I have guys around me who can use a computer better than I would ever be able to. And they produce wonderful material from the computer, laying things out, creating order, wonderful. But it's very, very hard to get what is original and creative from them. I'm the pack horse in my organization. I have to do all the hard work of creativeness, and I wish it were otherwise. And so we must be careful not to be taken in by this idea that the, you don't have to use your creativeness. The computer will do it for you. 
to get you knowledge, but it's all being packed into the personality. The obtaining of knowledge at the expense of spiritual discretion is not worthwhile. When I was very badly wounded in World War II, I had a fire experience. I was lying in, what do you call? I was lying in the crypt of an old church that had been turned into a casualty clearing station. And I was, had been hemorrhaging badly. I was very weak indeed. And I was aware that because I was not a walking patient, I would not be able to catch the plane that flew in right next to the church and picked up casualties and took them to Naples. And while I was lying there, feeling so ill, suddenly a force took me over. There was a loud bang, crash, and I thought, oh heavens, they're shelling the, the roof of this church. No, it wasn't that at all. It was as if some great being had taken hold of me lying flat on a stretcher in this black crib, crypt under the church and had clapped me on the top of the head right over what we today call Sahasrara, the thousand petaled lotus, and under my bare feet had clapped me like that. And suddenly there was a fire that passed through me. I was ablaze. I was ablaze and I was ecstatic. And I was filled with an energy that flowed from head to foot for what must be several minutes. When it was gone, I felt fit. I felt well. I no longer felt so weak and exhausted. And at that moment, at that moment, an orderly rushed into the crypt and shouted, Walking wounded, the plane's here. And I said to myself, Damn it, I'm getting on that plane. And I got off the, got off the stretcher, dragging my bandages along. I walked out strong enough for them to be convinced that I was a walking wounded. And got on that plane, and in 20 minutes I was in Naples, in the, best, in the hands of the best surgeons that the British Army could provide. Is it a, any wonder that I believe in the secret of the golden flower, that there is a flame within me and is available in you that can transform this life for you and make you a creative individual so that the books can flow from your pen, so that you, well, Certainly, it's available to you. I'm talking about, of course, the secret of the golden flower. And I used to symbolize it, as you'll find in my writings. I used to symbolize it with the letter S. All right, secret for the secret of the golden flower. But it was meant to be an indication of spiritual fire. Have you ever noticed when you have a candle, a lit candle, and you are sounding notes, that when you sound the letter S, the fire of the candle is dipped? Well, you'll find these things out. But also for me, S meant also a swan. S meant a swan. And the swan is a fabulous creature. And we will see that that particular symbol is very important with regard to the secret of the golden flower. Who knows who has cyclamens at home? The flower cyclamen. There you are, your hands wiggling and waggling. Yes, cyclamen. They pointed out last night on television the gardener there was the gardener there was uh, fussing around with cyclamens, and the cyclamen 
that he was planting in a pot for his good lady customer was very like this. The head of the, the, head of the um, uh, cyclamen is uh, like that, and its stalk is a kind of maze, and a maze, and that maze contains much of the secret of the golden flower. <laughs>